In the genealogy side, Ozzy shares mitochondrial sequence haplotype T with Stephen Colbert. And they may have descended from sisters thousands of years ago. He shares even a smaller subset of sequence from haplotype T2 with Harvard professor Skip Gates. Ozzy found this uh, pretty amusing that he could potentially be related to anybody that was a Harvard professor. <laughs> Finally, based on shared variants, it's found that he's related to the people buried at Pompeii. This is a screenshot from uh, Gnome's genealogy browser, and it's the basis for the previous slide. As you can see, and I'm going to... Ozzy right here is listed in green, coming from his uh, mother, Lillian, and <clears throat> resides in this group right, this group of diamonds here with Skip Gates. You can see here the uh, Stephen Colbert is right there in the other white section, and just above that, so it's a little bit hard to see on here, but right here, those are the two sisters that he would have descended from. And in this browser, uh, this is the this is one thing that Gnome uses to be able to kind of take some of this data. And this at first may seem to make complete sense based on his personality and his past life choices, or it may, may make no sense at all in, in, this, in, in some arenas. Some people still believe that Neanderthals and humans uh, were separate species. However, based on the recent Neanderthal uh, draft genome that came out in Science uh, just back in May, it's now uh, believed that humans and Neanderth Neanderthals uh, were on the Earth for about 10,000 years together, and there was interbreeding at that time. Even from a simple project like this, it helps us to start to understand better our own human lineage. <laughs> to note, George Church, one of the founders of Gnome, has about three times more Neanderthal DNA in his genome. I show this picture, and I've talked to him before about this. This doesn't come as a big surprise. <laughs> which collate research findings from scientific studies and information from HG19. Interestingly, Ozzy has about 300,000 undocumented variants in his genome, or variants that do not show up in the databases. And some of the basal findings include the fact he's the slowest settilizer of caffeine, and admits himself, as you can read on the right side of the slide here, <clears throat> that caffeine has a very large effect on him physically. He's six times more likely to have a dependency or attraction to alcohol, of which his reaction was, uh, yeah. <laughs> and 2.5 times more likely to have hallucinations under the effects of cannabis. However, based on some of the drug cocktails he used to ingest, it might be hard to figure out which one of those caused the hallucinations. And admits it used to make him throw up, and in his own words, it was a horrible waste of booze. <laughs> He scored low for nicotine addiction, which smoking was one of the first things he gave up when he came clean several years ago. There was also a variant seen in the regulatory region of his ADH4, alcohol dehydrogenase gene. Ozzy, Ozzy readily talks about drinking four bottles of cognac per day for many years. And this mutation could be implicated in increased alcohol metabolism. However, I would rather go with what his response was to that, which is, I'm, I don't need a Harvard professor to get to the bottom of that mystery. <laughs> One of the most interesting variants seen in Ozzy's genome is in his COMT gene. Most people sequenced to date show either the warrior, W-A-R, or the worrier, W-O-R variant. Ozzy has both. This gene's involved in the breakdown of neurotransmitters in the brain, dopamine in particular, Whereas the worrier, W-A-R, variant may increase the processing in response to aversive stimuli, the worrier variant, W-O-R, may be associated with increased memory and attention tasks. You can see the bottom of, of the, of, at the bottom of the slide Ozzy's reaction to this finding. <coughs> Overly simplified, I believe he raises an interesting point when looking at this data in the framework of his life. So, here's some databases, current and past research, and I presented kind of a basal overview of some of the highlights today. But really, why is Ozzy still alive? I mean, did he get lucky? Did he pass on that one last bottle of cognac that would have done him in? Is it in his DNA? Is it maybe the environment he grew up in, the environment that he lives in now? Is it the family unit that he surrounds himself with? Is kids and his mother and father? I think probably the best answer, and the one I'll lean on today, is Ozzy's own hypothesis. He's alive because of Sharon.
So what, we, what did we accomplish with this project? As I told you today, we found some interesting variation and we tried to infer some interesting phenotypes. We were able to generate excellent data under a tight timeline at Cofactor and I talked about the importance of stopping and taking a breath when things go off the rails in the wet lab. Cofactor is a small company, has a better understanding now of, of, of when you put the right team together, how it, you can produce results that add up more to the sum of its parts. And scientific, scientific collaboration with great minds and people you trust can be extremely fulfilling. But what our companies learned was bigger than the data I presented. With this project, we were able to plug a technical science endeavor into the pop culture machinery. People use pop culture all the time to carry their message or promote their product, music, or book every day. What about science? People love stories about rock stars and pop stars and movie stars. It flips pages in magazines. It causes people to follow individuals on Twitter that they don't even know. That's something I'm still trying to wrap my head around. Our company seized the chance to use the machinery to promote science and start having conversations with people who may have never cared what the letters SMP stand for. When we have these conversations with the general population, they may be more at ease in the future when every portion of our lives are touched by genomics. And hopefully, we're able to cast an exponentially large net to try and attract the next generation of scientists and researchers to carry on the work that we do today. At the end of it all, I'll tell you, we had a lot of fun working on this. Hopefully we educated some people. And at the end of the day, we just like to do good science. <laughs>